Well, how's everyone doing? Yeah? Then wear a smile on your face because that shows it, right? You're not fully dressed until you have a smile on your face, especially as Seventh-day Adventist Christians. We ought to be the happiest people in the world. And what better day to be happy than the Sabbath day, correct? All right. Well, we're going to get into an Old Testament story, and we'll be reading together. But before we get into the Word of God, what do you suppose we do? That's right. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Father in heaven, again, we just want to thank you for bringing us here to worship you. And we dare not do so without truth and spirit. And we know that Jesus is the truth, and we know who the spirit is. And so, Father, we're just inviting the Godhead to come and infiltrate us, imbibe us, and just completely take over us with your inspiration. May this worship service be to your glory and honor. And Father, as we contemplate lessons of formality, may we learn the importance of formality, but at the same time, not let it become our idolatry. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Just to set the record straight, because I had several members already come up and ask me about my new hairdo. (laughs) This is not a perm. This is my natural curls that I have. Uh, The strangest thing was, uh, if you see my parents, they don't have anything like this. And you see my sibling, she doesn't have it either. But uh, when I was growing up, I also didn't have this either. This came up and started sprouting like this when I hit puberty. It's weird. So so prior to puberty, I, I look like your typical Asian child with, you know, wire straight hair, but somehow after puberty, the curls started coming in. But if I keep it short, you wouldn't see it. But anyway, just wanted to set that record straight. Um, It was interesting going to the Korean church in, in, in Tennessee, and all the boys have curly hair. And apparently it's a a trend now for boys to get perms in the Korean culture. So I walked around going, natural? (laughs) Anyway. (laughs) All right. Let's talk about the idolatry of mere formalism. You could also say formality. I like that actually better. The idolatry of mere formality. We're going to look at an Old Testament story in the book of 1 Samuel. So I want you to get out your Bibles because you're only going to be seeing certain portions of the verse on the screen, but it's going to be helpful for you to be able to see the full context visually on your device or your book. And we'll be looking at 1 Samuel chapter 4, starting from verse 1. And I want to thank Fikar and Abigail for reading our verse together. Uh, Isn't it precious when children can read the word of the Lord? Yeah. All right, so we're going to start from verse 1. And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out to battle against the Philistines. They encamped at Ebenezer, and the Philistines encamped at Aphek. Now I want you to remember that when the Bible was written, it wasn't written with chapters and verses. You understand that, yes? Yes. This is a man-made invention that happened afterwards. So if you look at that verse just by itself without the context, what would you suppose? You would think that Samuel condoned Israel going to war with the Philistines, right? But if you read the full context, including the chapter prior to it, you will recognize that that's not so. 
Okay? So virtually every single scholar and commentator agrees that this first sentence, and the word of Samuel came to all Israel, does not belong in chapter 4, but it belongs at the end of chapter 3. Right, and so when you go back a verse, so that's why I was saying go look in your Bibles, you'll see the context. You'll see in 1 Samuel 3.21, it says, And Jehovah appeared again at Shiloh, for Jehovah revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of Jehovah, and the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Yeah. End of chapter 3. Okay? That makes more sense, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay, so let's go back to the next verse and start reading where it's technically supposed to start, all right? Now Israel went out to battle against the Philistines. Did God tell Israel to go fight the Philistines? No. Were Eli, who was the priest at the time and a judge, or Samuel, who was the upcoming judge and prophet, were they consulted? No. In fact, you will recognize contextually that Samuel is not even mentioned for the next three chapters of this book. That's how much the people of Israel divorced themselves from God and God's servants. For the next three chapters, Samuel's name is not even mentioned. And he's not even mentioned until the ark was returned. Spoiler alert, yes, the ark was taken. All right? And the ark was then returned, and then it was stored at Kirjus Jerem for many years. And then the book talks about Samuel again. That's how long Israel went out, went without God, okay? So let's talk about how Israel had this conflict with the Philistines. Now, granted, there is one going on right now, but we're just going to look at it from the historical perspective. If you look at Judges 13.1, it tells us that Israel was in bondage to Philistine for how many years? 40 years, 40 years, and 20 of those 40s were judged, were, were, were presided by the judge named, does anyone know? He was a mighty man, and he had really long hair. Right, Samson. So of the 40 years that Israel was in bondage to the Philistines, 20 of them was judged by Samson. Now, Eli's judgeship may have followed directly after or slightly overlapped Samson's uh, judgeship. And it tells us in 1 Samuel 4.18 that Eli was a judge for how many years? Look down there. Jump down to 18. For 40 years. Okay. So of the 40 years, at least 20 of them, Eli was judging. And then another 20 years went by and Eli dies. In fact, he dies in this chapter because of all the events that took place, uh, he hears the news of the ark being taken, and he, he hears this, and he was sitting on his chair at the gate, and he falls over, and he breaks his neck, and he dies, tragically. And the Bible tells us that he was 98 years old. This is just a personal thought. I really think the man had diabetes, because the Bible tells us that he was heavy, and his eyesight was poor. And if you look at the practices of his dietary practices that his sons had, where do you think his sons learned to take the meat like that from his father? And so more than likely, he had a very carnivorous diet. And so he had diabetes. He lived, yes, up to almost 98 years old. But that's just my uneducated medical opinion. So anyway, continuing. Let's go to verse 2. And the Philistines drew up in line against Israel, and when the battle spread, Israel was defeated by the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 men on the field of battle. How many were killed? 4,000. 4, Is that significant? Yes. Oh, yeah. So who won this battle? The Philistines. Why? Because they fought this battle... With God or without God? Without God. They didn't even consult him. They went motivated by false confidence in their own strength, initiated the attack because they had been under Philistine rule for only how many years? 
40 years. And for now, during the time of Eli, they were actually in prosperity. The Philistines weren't bothering them. And here, towards the end of Eli's life, they decide, let's go poke the hornet's nest, right? We're going to do this because we're strong now, and we're mighty, and we can take them on. And they went forth in battle, not in humble faith, trusting in God, but with pride in their own cleverness and their own power, and we can do this. And when God was with them, as history tells us, there was not a single enemy that could stand before them. In fact, God could fight their battles without them drawing their swords even. All they had to do was march around the city of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. And yet, when he, God, was not with them, defeat was certain. Now, if you were a general and you sent people out to war and 4,000 of your men died and you got routed and they came back, what would you do? <laughs> Resign. <laughs> I, I like that answer. That is absolutely the answer of a true leader. Yes, resign. You should resign. But they didn't think they did anything wrong. They're like, there must have been some logistical issues that we were having. You know what? There must have been an incorrect formation over here. You know what? Let's change our tactics just a little bit here. In other words, when they made a mistake, they didn't repent, they doubled down. You've heard that term before? Yeah. yeah. Have you heard that in the news lately? It happens a lot. It happens with people. People, when they make a mistake, they have a hard time admitting they made a mistake, and they push their thought or agenda that was wrong and keep, well, they double down. It's like when you tell one lie, instead of confessing that you lied, you end up telling another lie to cover up the thing that you couldn't cover with the first lie. And then you tell another lie, and you just keep doubling down until you're in a hole so huge. And this is what happens with sin. Folks, when you feel the prompting of the Holy Spirit to repent, do it. Don't hesitate. As you heard earlier, today is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow. If you've got issues you need to take care of, take care of it tonight. In fact, the Bible says don't let the sun go down on your anger. So if you have issues with your family members, with someone else, and you know it's piercing your heart, deal with it before you go to bed tonight. Don't double down on your pride. But this is exactly what the Philistines did because you'll see in verse 3 they said, And when the troops came to the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord, or Jehovah, defeated us today before the Philistines? Oh, I know what we ought to do. Let us bring the ark of the covenant of Jehovah here from Shiloh, that it may come among us and save us from the power of our enemies. Oh, boy. So the people went to Shiloh and brought from there the ark of the covenant of Jehovah from Hos, of Hos, who is enthroned on the cherubim. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the ark of the con covenant of God. We'll talk about the ark in a moment, but who were Hophni and Phinehas? They were sons of Eli, as it says here. Now, what work did they do? They were appointed priests by their father, Eli. Were they worthy to be priests? No, they weren't. Were they obedient? No. Disciplined? No. <laughs> Responsible? No. Righteous? No. Then what were they doing being priests? Far too often we have leaders that aren't deserving to be leaders. And we're not talking about just church. We're talking about in the secular world too. These Sons of Eli's, the Bible tells us in 1 uh, Samuel chapter 2, verse 12, that they were worthless men. 
worthless men. In the King James, it says they're son of Belial. You know who Belial is, right? Yeah. He's not a divine deity. He is essentially a euphemism for the devil. Now, the sons of Eli's were worthless men, or sons of Satan. They did not know whom? Jehovah. You know what uh, the psalmist tells us? He says that only a fool denies that there is a Jehovah. Right? And yet they were performing in the office of a priest. So while they were operating as priests, what did they do? They would take their three-pronged pork, uh, fork, sorry, not pork, <laughs> their fork, three-pronged fork, and they would go to the priests and people that would come to uh, provide their offering before God, and, you know, usually it involved the slaying of an animal, and you cook that animal, either in a pot or a cauldron or somewhere, right? Well, the, 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 the custom they had was they would take their fork and stick their fork into whatever was cooking and pull it out, and anything that came out belonged to the priest, and they could eat that. Okay? Now, what they would do was they would deliberately look for the largest pieces and greedily take it even before it was properly cooked. Now, God permissively let people eat flesh food, but he told it to eat it without the blood and without the fat. And you're supposed to burn off all of that or let it drain. And yet, these guys here were going around saying, no, we want it raw. And that's what they did. They took their meat and they did this to the point where in verse 17 it tells us that thus the sin of the young men were, was what? Very great, very great in the sight of Jehovah. For the men treated the offering of Jehovah with contempt. Let us not get into a position where we treat the things of God with contempt. So, the choices that they made in their youth became part of their adult character. Because as they became adults, they became even more contemptuous. And this is why they brought the Ark of the Covenant. What were they trying to accomplish with this Ark? They were trying to have the presence of God, because they knew they needed it, to achieve a victory. Yet, they treated the ark like a lucky charm, something superstitious. Is that what the ark was? What is the significance of that ark? Uh, in the book, Patriarchs and Prophets, it says, With this sacred chest were associated the most wonderful revelations of God's truth and power. In former days, miraculous victories had been achieved wherever, whenever it appeared. It was shadowed by the wings of the golden cherubim and the unspeakable glory of the Shekinah, the visible symbol of the Most High God, had rested over it in the Holy of Holies. Did ordinary people get to see the ark on a regular basis? No, it was residing in the Holy of Holies right? Which was the in, inner compartment of the sanctuary. You'd have to get through the gate, the courtyard, the holy place, just to get to the holy of holies, or the most holy place. And even the priest went in there only once a year, okay? Yet they brought out the ark because they were treating it like their little rabbit's foot, and they said, they were going to win this battle now because now we have our token of our deity here. Now, do you think that they were being, what's the word, insincere? No, they truly believed this would work, which is why they did it. If you look at the history, Many of the evil atrocities happened because the person perpetrating it thought that it was for good. You look throughout history. It's very rare that people do things that are evil with evil intent. 
And here we have Hophni and Phinehas, because of how they were growing up, treating the things of Jehovah with contempt, they even treated the Ark of the Covenant with contempt. As soon as the Ark of the Covenant of Jehovah came into camp, all Israel gave a mighty shout so that the earth resounded. That must have been pretty loud, right? And when the Philistines heard the shout, noise of shouting, they said, what does this great shouting in the camp of the Hebrews mean? And when they learned that the Ark of Jehovah had come to the camp, the Philistines were afraid. Should they be? Yeah. Oh yeah, they should be. For they said... A God has come into the camp. The word God is translated from the word, Hebrew word what? Does anyone know? Elohim, Elohim that's right, Elohim. Is Elohim a plural word or a singular word? Plural. It's plural. Just like when you say women or children, it's definitely plural. But notice the verb that's there. A God has come. It's a singular verb. So in other words, literally what you read there is Elohim has come. When in correct grammar, it should be Elohim have come. Okay? Did the Philistines recognize who Jehovah was? Somewhat. They had an idea of who this deity was, because look what goes on here in the next part. And they said, woe to us, the gods. Here, here it's the word, same word, Elohim, right? Woe to us, for nothing like this has happened before. Woe to us. Who can deliver us from the power of these mighty gods, Elohim? These are Elohim who struck the Egyptians with every sort of plague in the wilderness. Now, I don't understand how in the world they went from a singular to a plural in, in their vernacular. It's a little confusing, I know, but something there bears studying out. These pagan people had an idea of who Jehovah God was. And they heard the story of the mighty exodus. And they were terrified because now the symbol of this Jehovah God was there. So they had a a, a, a battle cry, take courage and be men, O Philistines, lest you become slaves to the Hebrews as they have been to you. Be men and fight. So the Philistines fought, and Israel was defeated, and they fled every man to his own. Well, those that were alive, right? Because it says, and there was a very great slaughter, for there fell of Israel how many? 30,000 foot soldiers. How many died the first time? When you double down, you have a tendency to suffer more loss. And the ark of God was captured. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died. What was the cost of doubling down? Instead of repenting, God, we made a mistake. We shouldn't have gone and fought the Israelites. You never told us to. We repent. Please forgive us. We want to follow you and do what you want us to do. If they had done that, they wouldn't have died. And yet, they didn't. They doubled down, and they lost seven and a half more times more people, and they lost their the Ark of the Covenant. What a tragedy. Adelaide Albert Esteb was born in La Grande, Oregon, November 17, 1901. He was ordained to a ministry in the Seventh-day Adventist Church in 1923 and then went to be a missionary in China for 14 years, 1923 to 1937. When he returned, he served in various capacities, and he also served as the Associate Secretary for Home Missionary Department. I wonder if we still have that anymore at the General Conference. And then in 1966, he was cited as the 
poet laureate of our worldwide church. He wrote several books of poetry and devotionals and other books. Uh, here's a sampling of them, but lately we've been reading from Morning Manna. It's a devotional uh, for young people, and this is something that we read. And in there, he talks about this incident, and he says, how prone is man to trust for salvation in forms of rites or material symbols? They thought that if only the ark of God were brought to the battlefield, they would have victory. They forgot that the ark alone could not save them. It was a symbol of a spiritual relationship. It was not the ark, but God himself who, what? Could save them. What could save them? Was it the ark? No, it was the living deity. The one who was life itself, Jehovah, right? It continues, there was no more power in the ark itself than in the idols of the heathen. Having the ark was useless unless the relationship with God, which it symbolized, was what it should have been. Was it what it should have been? No, the relationship wasn't there. Wearing a cross externally, how many of us know somebody that does that, or I hope none of you do that, but if you wear a cross externally, it does not indicate that the meaning or the message of the cross has transformed the life of the inner man. As Billy Sunday used to say, going into a church does not make you a Christian any more than going into a garage makes you an automobile. Merely going through the forms of religious service is what? Not enough. God looks at the heart. It is the motive that counts. And there's a difference between saying prayers and actually praying. Why did they make the Ark of the Covenant an idol? Did they do that on purpose? No, they didn't say, oh, let's take the ark and now let's make it an idol. No, they really thought that this hunk of uh, a box that was made out of wood, covered with gold, they really thought it had magical properties. They deluded themselves into thinking this. Why else would they bring this token to the battlefield unless they thought it would actually work? It was because they took their religious formality and left it as formality. This is how it became idolatry. If you think about it, that box is lifeless, but it represents the all-powerful, omnipotent, omniscient, life-giving source of life, God. They forsook the creator God for the creation. And this is what we're guilty of in our lives. You'll see. Again, patriarchs and prophets, they had not realized that their faith was only a nominal faith. What does nominal mean? In name only. Okay? In name only. A lot of people say they're Christian, but are they really? A lot of people say they're Seventh-day Adventists, but are they really? Their faith was only a nominal faith and had lost its power to prevail with God. The law of God contained in the ark was also a symbol of his presence, but they had cast contempt upon the commandments, had despised their requirements, and had grieved the Spirit of the Lord from among them. When the people obeyed the holy precepts, the Lord was with them to work for them by his infinite power. But when they looked upon the ark and did not associate it with God, nor honor his revealed will by obedience to his law, it could avail them little more than a common box. They looked to the ark as the idolatrous nations looked to their gods, as if it were, was possessed in itself the elements of power and salvation. 
They transgressed the law it contained, for their very worship of the ark led to formalism, hypocrisy, and idolatry. Question is, how many of us today, with our very worship, have a formalistic, hypocritical, and idolatrous worship? How many of us are engaged in formality? Let me see some hands. Hey, come on. Every single one of you should be raising your hands. We are all engaged in formality. Even those of you watching on YouTube, you're engaged in formality. If you, at any point in your life, walked into a church, sat in a pew, stood up to sing opening hymn, or kneeled to pray, even closed your eyes and folded your hands, you are engaging in formality. When you visit a church for the very first time and you sign the guest book, you are engaging in formality. When you take your offering out of your pocket and put it in the box or in the plate, you are engaging in formality. But formality doesn't always have to be just religious. This, a couple months ago, my parents and my sister and I, we were able to travel. And one of the things that you have when you travel are borders. And normal people, when you come to a border, you have to present documents. And so we had to wait in very long lines with our US passports to get from one country to another country. When you present that passport, you are following a formality. When you stand for the bride at a wedding, as she enters in, you are engaging in formality. I think we all recognize that we all engage in formality. Yes? So let me ask once again, how many of us are engaged in formality? All right, more hands, good. So I think all of us can agree that formality is important, yes? Okay, after all, it's the way you do things. Uh, for instance, when you go into a church, you come and sit in the pews, and unless you're assigned, you don't come up to this platform, right? That's part of the formality. If you come earlier for Sabbath school, which all of you should, and you go to a classroom with a teacher and you have other students, you engage in conversations about the lesson, not politics or your job, because that's part of your formality, right? Formality is important because it brings structure. It brings order. And Again, after all, it's the way you're supposed to do things. For instance, as the priest of my household, I lead my wife and five children. Hi, family, I know you're watching. We have family worships. We have family worships morning and evening. And parents, it's never too late to start. You need to start having this formality ingrained in your children at an early age. Even if they don't understand the meaning behind it initially, you have to get them engaged in going through that motion because those formalities are important. So I lead my wife and five children in morning and evening worships, and if I'm not there, my wife will lead, and this is our formality. We start with a prayer. We sing a hymn. And then we read a chapter from the Bible. Or we read a devotional piece. And then we have closing prayer. And then we all together have or uh, recite the Lord's Prayer together. That's our formality for our family worship. And so if any of you come over, well, now to Tennessee, 
If you come over and you're there when we have worship, this is the sequence we'll be following. It is important for us to establish proper formality, especially for children. And even as adults, you need to become more formal in your exercise, right? You need to exercise more formality in when you go to bed. Yeah, that's a big problem for a lot of us, right? How many of us are still doing this at night, right? How many of you had your phone hit your nose before? Come on. You need to have better formality when it comes to sleeping habits. Remember, form, formality is something that we engage in because we do things that way. Am I doing the right thing by establishing these forms in my children? Okay. I'm going to give you some biblical evidence as to why form is important. Turn with me to the very first book of the Bible. The book of beginnings, Genesis chapter 1, starting from verse 1. And we will read, In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. Friends, tell me, what were the two characteristics of this planet? It had no form, and it was void. That's right. It was formless and empty. Can we say it that way? Yes. So the earth was without form and void. It was formless and empty. Then you had the first day of creation, and what did God create? In verse 3 in Genesis 1, you'll see that he created light. On day 2, what did he create? He split the waters and injected atmosphere, right? And then on day three, what did he create? Look at verse nine. He created dry land and also the vegetation that came up out of that dry land, okay? What did he create on day four? Verse 14. Sun, moon, and stars, heavenly bodies. What did he create on day five? Bird and fish, or fish and fowl. And then day six, he created the land animals and also man. Now, interestingly enough, remember, the earth was without form and void. So let's look at the creation week in that context, okay? Formed and filled. So on the first day, he created the form of light, on the second day, or on the fourth day, he created, he filled those forms of light with heavenly bodies. On the second day, he created the form of atmosphere, and then he filled that atmosphere. Water is a kind of atmosphere, okay? Air is actually a form of liquid, too. You're swimming through air, all right? So he filled those spaces with birds and fish. And then on day three, he created the form land and vegetation, and then he filled that land with animal and man. Right? So, when he created man, in fact, he also followed the same formula. He followed the same formed and filled formula. If you look in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, it says, And the Lord... God did what? Formed, formed him with what? Dust of the ground. So he got down on his hands and knees and started putting the dust together. He was making the form. And then what did he do? He breathed into his nostrils and filled the man's lungs with the, the breath of life. So you have the form and you have the filling, which then man becomes a living soul. Is that all he did on the week of creation? No. What else did he do? Did he stop? 
No, he continued his creative work and he's created, what did he create next? Look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. And then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested or ceased from all his work which God had created and made. So on the seventh day, what did he create? What did he create? We just read it, right. He created the Sabbath. He created the Sabbath on the seventh day. He created that form. What do you suppose he filled it with? Himself. Because he wants to spend time with you. He wants to spend time with us. So he, he created the form of the Sabbath on the seventh day and filled it with his presence. There's something that only works in English that I'm going to show you here. It's, this does not follow any conventional rules or anything like that, but it's, it's fun, okay? Take a look at the word Sabbath. What's in the very middle of Sabbath? Ha ha. Hmm. Yeah. In the midst of the Sabbath is our Father. All right. So he filled and formed, filled and formed, filled and formed, or for, formed and filled, formed and filled, sorry, formed and filled. So this formed and filled uh, motif, let me ask you, what comes first, the form or the filling? If you don't have the form, can you fill? No. no. So what, is, what use is the filling? Unless you have the form. So are forms important? But is it enough? No, you need to have the form and you also need to have the filling. That's right. As children, did Hophni and Phineas establish good form? No. As such, when they got older, they had nothing to fill. And ultimately, what happens if God formed man out of the dust of the ground and filled him with the breath of life if you don't have proper form, where's, where can he put that breath of life? He can't. Therefore, you will cease to exist. Does this make sense? This is why Hophni and Phinehas, they died. And I would venture to guess that they didn't just die the sleep death. When resurrection comes, they will be resurrected to the resurrection of death. Okay? So, this is why, as little children, it says, train up a child in the way he should go, right? Proverbs 22, 6. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Children, you know this song, right? Train up a child in the way he should go. Right? This is why it's important to have those proper formality inculcated, instructed into our children. And in fact, Luke 16, 10 tells us that he that is faithful in little is also faithful in much. You know, the opposite is also true. If you're unfaithful in little, you will be also unfaithful in much. So, young people, whatever your hand finds to do, do with all your might. And do it as if you're doing it for God. Give it your best. Don't do things haphazardly. Be faithful even in the littlest details. I would submit that even Jesus recognized the importance for religious formality. Notice what he said during the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. He says, For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, the scribes and the Pharisees were known for their pretensions of piety, their human inventions and ceremonies, and even their boasted performance of all the outward requirements of, of law. And all of these were examples of Pharisaical formalism. Yes? And what did Jesus refer to this Pharisaical formalism as? He said it was their 
the righteousness of scribes and Pharisees. Now, granted, the Old Testament tells us your righteousnesses are as filthy rags. We all know that. But here he's saying, hear me out, notice what he says, will the religious formality, the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, will that give them entrance into the kingdom of heaven? Absolutely not. In fact, Jesus tells us that our righteousness has to exceed their religious formality or their righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Does this make sense? You need to have something in addition to or more than their formalism. Why is this relevant to me? Well, did you know that the Bible prophesied that formalism will be a last day characteristics? Do you know that we're living in the last days? Okay. Well, turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting from verse 1. It says, but know this, that in the what? Last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves. Does that mean selfish? Egotistical, narcissistic? Okay. Lovers of money, does that mean greedy? Okay. Boasters, does that mean prideful? Because it even says the next word, proud, right? Blasphemers, you know what a blasphemer is? Someone who takes the Lord's name in vain, right? You know who the biggest blasphemer is? Someone who claims to be a Christian and doesn't live like one. Because you're taking on the Lord's name, but you're doing it in vain. It's not just swearing, okay? That's little kid stuff. True blasphemy is rejecting God in your life, but claiming that you have God. Disobedient to parents. How many are guilty of that? I am. <laughs> Unthankful. You complain more than you give thanks. Yeah? Unholy. Unloving. Unforgiving. Oh, I'm going to hold this grudge. Slanders. By the way, you know what slander is? Anyone know? Biblically speaking, slander always necessitates a lie. It's when someone says something about somebody else and it's absolutely false. And they say it anyway. That's slander. Okay? That happens, even in churches. Without self-control, that means intemperate. Right? If you overeat. If you have too much of whatever. Brutal. Despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of God in us, but what? Denying its power, and from such people turn away. Is this list of descriptors, is this about people in the world or in the church? Help me out. The more I read this, yes, it's applicable to both, okay? It's applicable to all humanity. But the more I read this, the more I'm being convinced that this is a description of people in the church. We are having a form of godliness, but deny its power, and therefore we have all of these issues. And all of us raised our hand at one point, right, about these issues. So yes, personally, I think this list is very accurate in describing us church members. I mean, think about it. You, you can probably think of someone who comes to church and exhibits one of these above, right? Just not me. Somebody else, oh, that person over there, right? No, all kidding aside, we all are implicated here, folks. So what is this form of godliness? It's the er external characteristics of, of religion, like church attendance or church giving or even personal service to the church. All of these are, are examples of the form of godliness, the formality. And yet you can do all of that. You can sit in these pews. You can give your tithe. You can say the right things. You can close your eyes when you pray. You can come to church on the correct day of the week. And yet you are still denying God's power. 
because if you do this, your formality has become idolatry. So then how do we not deny its power? In fact, what is this power? Let's turn to Romans 1.16. It says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. The gospel is the power of God for salvation. The word power in all these places are translated from the same Greek word, dunamis. You guys know about that, right? Dunamis, dynamite, power, right? The gospel is the power of God. What is the gospel? Good news. That's what it literally means. Good news about what? Jesus Christ and how he can save you. It is the power of salvation. Do you have the gospel in your life? How do you get the gospel? Well, you got to read it. If you can't read, listen to it. But more than just reading it and listening to it, you need to live it. 2 Corinthians 13, 4, For he was crucified in weakness, but lives by the power of God. Notice, life is associated with God, his power. The box, the ark, it's lifeless. Idolatry is lifeless. Form is lifeless. Your formality is lifeless. The form of the body on the ground is lifeless. You need to be filled with the power of God in order to live. For we also are weak in him, but in dealing with you, you will live with him by the power of God. Ephesians 3.20, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. It sounds like you need the power inside you. How can you let something in you unless you consent? Do you want to have this power? Do you want to stop being just merely formal? Then, well, we need to ask, then, how am I to abide in Christ? Well, we're told in Steps to Christ, in the same way that you received Jesus at first. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk you in him. The just shall live by faith. You gave yourself to God to be his holy, to serve and obey him, and you took Christ as your savior. You could not atone for your sins or change your heart, but have given yourself to God. You believe that he, for Christ's sake, did all this for you. By faith, you become Christ, and by faith, you are to grow up in him by giving and taking. You are to give all, your heart, your will, your service. Give yourself to him to obey all his requirements, and you must take all. Christ, the fullness of all blessing, to abide in your heart, to be your strength, your righteousness, your everlasting helper, to give you power to obey. How many of us are like the ancient Israelites? Instead of depending on God, we take our form of godliness and we march into battle against the enemy with our Ark of the Covenant. We need to be marching into battle with our enemy, Satan, with God's Ark of the Covenant, not ours. With his righteousness, not mine with what he can fill me with. Because like ancient Israel, when men today depend upon a form of religion rather than that vital connection or union with God, we may as well kneel down and worship gods of stone. You might as well do that. Do you want to have the righteousness that exceeds the, form, uh, the pharisaical formalism? and enter into the kingdom of heaven? Yes? Do you want to not merely have the form of godliness, but the power of God also? If that's the case, I want you to stand. Signify to Jesus Christ, yes, I want to consecrate myself to God this morning. We want to make this our very first work. We want to pray a prayer. Let's pray. Take me, O Lord, as holy thine. I lay all my plans at your feet. 
Use me today in your service. Abide with me and let all my work be wrought in you. Help us to make this a daily matter. Help us to consecrate ourselves to you every day for that day, to surrender all our plans to you, to be carried out or given up as your providence will indicate. And so then, as we do this and go through those forms, may we be filled because we are day by day giving our lives into your hands and being molded by you more and more after the life of Christ. Father, we pray that you form us and fill us, but especially fill us with your presence, with your love, with your power. For we ask this and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.